mercantile capitalism and biblical interpretation of the environment, how it combines with science and technology in the 17th century. There are three strands of environmental thought in the US. First one is Judeo-Christian, the second is utilitarianism, and third is wilderness thinking. And then contrast in the environmental thought between America and India. And then what is the intersection between medical and environmental history? And I'll be giving case studies from colonial history and contemporary South Asia and approaches to the study of the topic. One is the annual school or the longitude and the other one is subaltern studies. So this is uh, what the first aspect. And then next is the Judeo-Christian narrative. The biblical Garden of Eden has three chapters, creation, temptation, and expulsion. In Genesis 1, God created land, grass, sea, herbs, and fruit, sun, stars, moon, birds, and beasts, after which he made man in his own image, male and female. The couple was instructed to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. I would highly recommend that you all refer to Caroline Merchant, Reinventing Eden, The Fate of, the fate of Nature in Western Culture, published by Rutledge in 2004. So it deals with the American view of nature and the Western view in general. During the scientific revolution in the 17th century, reason and experimentation were key to recreating the Garden of Eden on Earth. Upward mobility, Provided by property ownership, God's glory in the world was celebrated through nature's loss. This is during the scientific revolution in the 17th century. That is, it was appropriation of biblical idea of recreating Garden of Eden on Earth. And also, how do you maximize productivity on the land? So apply scientific principles. So that's very interesting. So nature was conceptualized as a mathematical order. The beginnings of conservation took place in the 17th century. From the mid 14th century to 15th century, outbreaks of bubonic plague decimated populations. Forests grew back, marshes returned. European population increased and a new phenomenon called mercantile capitalism reshaped European land beginning the 17th century. During the 17th century, the Christian narrative of domination of nature was combined with science, technology, and capitalist development to remake the world as a controlled, managed Garden of Eden. So this is actually a personification of manifest destiny of US. That is, this is the Wild West. This is a a uh, canvas painting of Andrew Jackson, Trail of Tears. This is actually the westward movement of uh, in, uh, American frontier history. You can see the representation of Amerindians as savages. You can see the land being opened for cultivation, the white man moving with a plow to the west of the Mississippi River. This is around 1860 to 1890. This is the manifest destiny, pervasive belief in American cultural Christianity and racial superiority. So this you see in Americans' treatment of the Philippines, the application of manifest destiny principle, distinguish, distinguishing tropical other from that of America. Civilization's role to keep wilderness in check, control a mastery of nature, that is grasslands being brought under the plow. This photo shows it all, infinite resources. This, is the, this lady represents ma manifest destiny. Very interesting aspect, frontier aspect of American history. Now, let's go to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, I'm sorry for jumping to and fro in chronology, but I wanted to keep the discussion more or less limited to philosophy of history so that you'll get a better idea on how to approach the new subject of environmental history. There's a lot written in Indonesia, but we need to join the dots. I'll come to that later. But now I will be speaking about Adam Smith. Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, discussed four stages of economic development, hunting, animal husbandry, farming, and commerce. Smith argued that hunting and animal husbandry should be replaced by agriculture and commerce in wealth of nations, while nature has potential to provide humans with necessities of life, 
it is worthless unless it is transformed by human labor nature instills conscience in human kind and enables them to carry out god's plans but nature can also be recalcitrant people must be prepared to override a recalcitrant nature smith constructed a master narrative in which it was civilization's role to keep wilderness in check with an inverted commas that is very important that is how human labor adds value to the land that's what smith wants to say in the street is wealth of nations so what is american environmental thought compared to tropical landscapes temperate landscapes are more benign they are amenable to utilitarian ends they can be cultivated english philosopher aldous huxley pointed out that worship of nature came easily to those who lived under a temperate sky in the age of henry ford a particular weakness of american thought is its narrow focus <laughs> on individual attitude to nature there is limited focus to locate these attitudes in the cultural context American environmental history, for example, is re reduced to a polarized struggle. That is a Manichaean struggle between a between the preservationists, such as former American President Theodore Roosevelt, who uh, who was the president of America between 1901 and 1909. He believed in the creation of wilderness parks or nature reserves throughout the U.S. he intended to preserve nature for its own sake and utilitarians who with the aid of science intended to transform nature into useful commodities roderick nash is a utilitarian in american environmental thought third stream of thought in american environmental history is the native american philosophy primitivist a the theory of history has inspired radical proposals such as reduction of the world's population by 90% biocentric equality best represented by native american thinker wine de loria junior hunters and food gatherers were perhaps the only real environmentalist that it was imperative to reduce the world population by 90% so this is very important so now i will be speaking about what is the difference what is unique about south or southeast asian environmental history i'll be giving examples from india wilderness is the prevailing environmental philosophy in the us that is preserving nature for its own sake whereas in india it is agrarianism mahatma gandhi invoked the spirit of spirit of community so intrinsic to present culture you see mobilization of gandhi on developmental projects in the 1920s you see him organizing satyagraha non violent resistance to building dams on rivers in the bombay presidency the mulshi satyagraha of mahatma gandhi so it is question about livelihood securing people's livelihood to land and uh, land issues people have a emotional connect with land so it is not diverse from culture environmentalism in india it is not diverse from struggle for land in the us wilderness thinking is hostile to agriculture in india agricultural thinking is not predisposed to the conservation of wild animals human environmental uh, or animal conflict rather is more conspicuous in india should refer to ramachandra guha's authoritative how much should a person consume this is uh, published by university of california at berkeley 2006 very important to understand this aspect differences in environmental thinking and what gives southeast asian environmental history its own standing so we should use this as a case study india as a case study so now i will be speaking about a gandhian perspective of environmental thinking in india so have you all heard of chipko movement chipko movement is actually a environmental movement in uh, himalayan region of garhwal that is close to nepal china border i would say so what happened in here the region was it was actually under the uh, british call it was a british colony under indirect british rule rich in forest resources temperate broadleaf forests so after independence there was a proposal uh, to uh, give away the land for contractual timber harvesting to big companies so women local women 
they organized a human chain inspired by Meera Ben Gandhi's follower, Sundarlal Bahun Nugna. He was an environmentalist inspired by Gandhi. A non-violent satyagraha, a human chain, hugging trees, prevention of uh, 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 deforestation. And also it's a question of access to livelihood for women. Trees, for example, they provide fuel. Trees also have an emotional connect with women. That is, many social activities take place around trees. For example, trees are worshipped by native people in the Himalayas. So, you see, it's not just about environmental conservation. It also has a cultural connect. But in US, it's all only about environmental conservation, preservation of habitat of the gray wolf in the Yellowstone National Park, those kinds of issues. So it's very different, the approach to environment in both countries in India, as well as US. India has a higher population density compared to US. It's very interesting. It's more holistic. I had actually done a course in environmental history as a master's student 13 years back in the University of Iowa. And some of the PowerPoint slides are taken from my notes, actually, master's notes. This is actually the women who formed the human chain Chipko movement, 1974, 67 to 74. They form a human chain hugging the trees, nonviolent. Now I will be speaking about environmentalism in China. So how is, that's a new alternative, right? A Marxian alternative to environmental history, 50s to 70s. Between 1949 and 76, Mao Zedong sought to uh, redesign Chinese society by remodeling nature. In 1950s, Soviet-style industrialization and environmental issues, they cropped up. That is, Soviet-style industrialization would mean large-scale industrialization. He repudiated uh, environmentalists uh, who uh, warned about China's imminent population rise. He believed that China's rising population could serve as a counterforce to the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, it, it could also stand up to Western threats. It could also maximize productivity in the communes. The Great Leap Forward, 58 to 60, decimated China's forests. Utopian hydroelectric projects displace millions from their land. This is actually very interesting. Maoist propaganda, the campaign against the four pests, the rats, the sparrow, the flies, and the mosquito, right? Very interesting. And uh, why is this important? Because sparrows symbolically, they devour grain, right? So they devour grain, so they are parasites. So they need to be put down to increase productivity of grain in the commune. I will say that the, it could be argued that uh, it created a famine in 60, that is the decimation of sparrows, millions of sparrows. And Mao instead had to substitute sparrow with bed bug in the campaign against four pests. So it's very interesting to see how a cultural, uh, how it is very important to, it is interesting to see mobilization of people based on political propaganda in China and cultural notions. For example, the communist uh, propaganda uh, poster depicting the foolish old man. You can see this poster here on the right, uh, who moved uh, mountains and the, this is Dazai and terracing rice fields for uh, cultivation and uh, using commu uh, commune, uh, communes, commune brigades, and that maximizes productivity. And does I experiment, it was centralized. The same pattern was exported to other communes as well, say in uh, Guangdong, Yunnan, other provinces of China. So what happens when one model is exported to other parts? Very interesting to see. So Mao's thought on the environment, humans could transcend environment. There's a certain man-environment dualism in Mao's thought human mastery of nature, use of militarized metaphors such as war against nature, political repression of intellectuals, utopian urgency, dogmatic conformity, and state-ordered relocation. Refer to Judith Shapiro's book, Mao's War Against Nature. That's an important reading if you want to understand the nature of communist thinking on environment. So this is what happens when uh, sparrows are killed, increase in uh, locust population that divorce crops, uh, famine following the Great Leap around 1960. By 1960, Mao orders removal of sparrows from big pest campaign and replaces them with bed bugs. So now I will be uh, showing you how we can uh, actually bring about a conversation between urban history, environmental history, and medical history. In University of Ayurlanga, many professors, I believe, work on 
anthropology, ecofeminism. There are few who work on urban history and others who work on medical history. So what is the intersection? Let us think about the Indian Ocean as a disease zone. Now I will be speaking about why a regional perspective matters. History provides context to understand global trends. If national or local histories lose track of international events that shape con uh, contemporary health and environmental concerns, global scholarship on Southeast Asia loses track of particularities, especially how notions of human rights, biomedicine or environment were appropriated and transformed in a local context. A regional approach enables us to grab the nuances, grasp the nuances of how international ideas of environmentalism or health for all get appropriated and translated in specific local settings. See, for example, my work on the history of pandemics in Southeast Asia, a return of national anxieties in ISIS current bibliography. It's open access, you can access it on ISIS current bibliography, history of pandemics in Southeast Asia, a return of national anxieties. In 2021, Southeast Asia is a microcosm of global health. The health of its inhabitants has improved in dramatic ways, thanks to medical intervention, political activism, and rapid economic growth. Widespread inequalities nevertheless remain with respect to health outcomes. Sheer ecological diversity of Southeast Asia make the region the hotbed of infectious disease. Now coming to the notion of Southeast Asia, it is a Cold War construct as Sunil Amrit and Tim Harper put it in the introduction in histories of health in Southeast Asia, perspectives on the long 20th century. The identity of Southeast Asia was imposed outside externally by the US, the formation of Southeast Asian command by British uh, governor, uh, by, I'm sorry, Viceroy of first Viceroy of uh, Independent India, Lord Mountbatten, headquartered at Kandy in 1943. It was a Viceroy of British India, Mountbatten. But Sri Lanka is in South Asia. So the headquarters of Southeast Asian command of the Allied forces was located in Sri Lanka. Maritime Southeast Asia can be understood better when connected with the Bay of, Bay of Bengal littoral. Let me give you an example. Let us think of Indian Ocean as a disease zone. David Arnold's authoritative The Indian Ocean as a Disease Zone, 1500 to 1950, published in South Asia, 1991. You will note that densely populated India and China have been reservoirs of disease since history. McNeil, in discussing the origins of Bubonic plague speculated that maritime trade routes from Asia via the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, as well as overland caravan routes and invading Mongol armies may have been responsible for the spread of disease into Europe and probably on more than one occasion. It is not unlikely too that epidemics of smallpox and probably of cholera from time to time took a ship from India along the wide established trade routes to East Africa, Persian Gulf, and Southeast Asia, or that the pilgrim routes to Mecca as the Muslim world expanded south and eastwards across the ocean became epidemic highways at least since the 17th century. Let us also look at Michael N. Pearson. He also speaks about the Indian Ocean world. And he speaks about the Portuguese and uh, interactions with uh, the Ayurvedic medicine of Goa, Portuguese Goa. So the ways in which Portuguese appropriated Goan Indian uh, materia medica, that's very interesting. Not only diseases, but also medical drugs and practices crossed the ocean or traversed its northern rim. Although conventionally described as a spice trade, the transoceanic commerce was also a trade in therapeutics, if only because the distinction between the curative and the culinary as with pepper was obscure. Also, have a look at Hans Paul's work in East, East Asia Science, Technology and Society journal. Very interesting. He speaks about uh, European, Indo-European women as intermediaries in the circulation of uh, medical ideas between the uh, Netherlands Indies and uh, Holland and the ways in which the spice trade forces us to rethink the origins of the scientific revolution and the way in which just Dutch East Indies was central uh, in some ways to the scientific revolution. Very interesting. 
Even in the 19th century, the European accounts of Asian Materia Medica were so full of substances with regard to their spices or beverages that the proper place might seem to be the kitchen, not the pharmacy. An interesting account is provided also by Hal Cook, Matters of Exchange, to better understand the ways in which in this archipelago contributed to the scientific revolution in the 17th century in the Netherlands. There was besides a trade in more exotic cargoes like African rhino horn, prized in the East as an aphrodisiac. Aphrodisiac is a painkiller or in staples like opium, which spread through the Muslim contact and conquest to become an important medical drug, as well as a narcotic in medieval South Asia. The great diversity of societies and civilizations clustered around the shores of the Indian Ocean littoral and its neighborhood gulfs and seas precluded the emergence before 1500 of a single perspective on disease and healing. But the establishment of Hinduized culture in parts of Southeast Asia, for example, say Sri Vijaya or Majapahit Empire, brought in ideas from India on disease causing and controlling deities, just as the subsequent rise of Islam introduced new medical terms, concepts, and therapeutic practices. Smallpox deity in Myanmar, in Thailand. Then you have a smallpox deity in Bali, the notion that bad karma causes smallpox deaths. That was a notion prevalent in Bali until around the 19th century, again imported from India, the idea. Then think about uh, Islamic medicine and healing. Let's uh, look at Jennifer Nurse, Nurse's work on Islamic healing. Do you all remember in 2017, I introduced you to the work of Jennifer Nurse on Islamic healing? That is in the medieval period of Indian history. Wali Sunan Gresik, he was actually originally from uh, Transoxiana region. He spent some time in the Delhi Sultanate. He brought in ideas of Islamic healing uh, into northern coast of Java. And uh, Jennifer Nurse's article shows the way in which healing helped in Islamization of Java. Very interesting. And the way in which it, uh, Islamic healing syncretizes with Nosh, Javanese cosmology of healing. Dukun for her, according to Nurse's article, is a Perso-Arabic import. Dukun. That is, it is derived from the Persian word dukan or pharmacy. So very interesting to see how ideas, how the translation of, cultural translation of medical ideas in medieval Indian slash Indonesian or Indian archipelago history. Very interesting. While the impact of disease invasions was relatively slight and geographically limited in the period up to 1750, the situation changed dramatically thereafter as Europe's engagement with the region changed gear, as European trade and commerce became more penetrative, as territorial empires were established, armies and cities grew in size, and new forms of transport and communication developed. In particular, the emergence of India as the linchpin of British power and trade in the East was of great epidemiological significance for the rest of the region and indeed the wider world beyond. The most striking demonstration of this was the rapid and ocean-wide spread of epidemic cholera from Bengal, which occurred around 1817 to 22. So Bengal, the origin of cholera, it is called Asiatic cholera, but I would oppose using the word Asiatic cholera unlike Peter Bungard because cholera was also prevalent in England in the mid 19th century, but Bengal was the home to endemic cholera. You see, tropical climate, rotting vegetation, heavy rainfall of around 70 inches a year. So that contributes to rise of cholera in the Sundarbans, the Ganges Delta. And then high population density, dead bodies thrown into rivers, those kinds of issues. So it's interesting. Although the prehistory of the disease remains obscure, there are references uh, from the 16th century onwards, which appear to describe cholera as those given by the Dutch physician Jacob Bontius in Batavia in 1629, or the French Sonerat on the Coromandel Coast. Coromandel Coast is Southeast India, just the closest to Indonesia, that's around 2000, uh, 2,500 kilometers or so from Aceh. 
However, these do not depict cholera in the virulently epidemic form as it became familiar in the early 19th century. It may be that cholera have had from time to time before this been communicated along trade routes between India and the islands of Southeast Asia, particularly Java and Sulawesi. But certainly in the 19th century, India and specifically Lower Bengal formed an endemic focus from which cholera radiated outwards in almost every direction. This is also true of India's Coromandel Coast in Southeast India. Endemic home to cholera because of tropical climate, cyclones, high density of population, fecal matter in rivers. It's interesting to see the disease advanced along two main routes. One lay overland across northern India from Bengal to Punjab and thence by a caravan routes into Afghanistan and southern Russia. The caravan routes from Punjab, that is Multan, today's Pakistan, to Astrakhan in Russia, there were Multani merchants called Malhotras, Aroras. They uh, managed the uh, overland routes into Afghanistan and southern Russia. So, uh, uh, cholera spread through caravan routes along Amur Daria. It's very interesting to see. And eventually into Poland, Germany, France, Britain, where it arrived for the first time in the early 1830s. Secondly, and more commonly, during the course of the century, epidemic cholera followed with expanding maritime traffic between India and the oceanic neighbors. It moved with traders and troops ships eastwards from Bengal and the Coromandel coast into Burma, Malaya, Thailand, where an estimated 100,000 people perished in 1819. Java, leaving 125,000 dead in 1821, particularly Central Java, and the rest of island Southeast Asia and on to East Asia, reaching Japan in 1822. It ran through Peninsula India to Sri Lanka, or swept southwest from Calcutta and Madras to Mauritius. The island was repeatedly visited by cholera between 1820s and 1870s, and thence to Zanzibar and the East African coast. Then, where an epidemic of 1865 was especially destructive, it headed westwards from Bombay to the Red Sea, Southern Arabia, Egypt, and thus to Mediterranean. From there, it entered Western Europe and crossed to the Americas. An important factor in the westward movement of cholera from South Asia to the Middle East and the Mediterranean was the Hajj pilgrimage the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. In a sense, cholera was picking up where bubonic plague had barely left off. Indeed, in many places, the two diseases followed identical trails, the customary line of pilgrimage and trade. Through pilgrims, cholera reached Mecca in 1831 and spread to other parts of the Middle East for the first time. An estimated 13% of population of Cairo died from the disease. In 1865, cholera struck pilgrims in Mecca, brought by Muslims from South and Southeast Asia who reached Jeddah by sea in large numbers as well as by traditional overland routes. See Arnold for more details. A uh, further factor was the rise of Calcutta as a trading metropolis. You can see Debajani Bhattacharya's monograph on Calcutta. For more details, accounts of colonial port cities have said little about the epidemiological significance of these urban centers. Yet in the history of epidemic disease in the Indian Ocean, region during the 19th century, especially the names of Calcutta, Bombay, Cape Town, Singapore, Hong Kong consist consistently recur along with lesser known or more specialized sports like Jeddah with its pilgrim tra traffic, Zanzibar, Karachi, Rangoon, Aceh, Banda Aceh as the critical nodes in an Indian Ocean wide or even global pattern of disease transmission. Cities like Calcutta, Bombay, Hong Kong performed much the same function in epidemiological terms as they did in commercial terms. They were disease anthropods, the principal points of entry for arriving pathogens, like the plague that established itself in Western, Indian India, Western India in 1896-97, which were then spread far and wide through the ports in the land by road. And rail, and there were points of departure from which diseases like the plague, Hong Kong in 1896 were exported to other parts of the ocean. By virtue of the geographical position and social characteristics, port cities might also be singularly suited as reservoirs and key incubators of disease. This photo from Calcutta, 1896, you see inoculation of poor population in uh, Shanty Town. This is Voldemar Hofkin uh, supervising inoculation of local people. You see Calcutta, crowded housing. It, uh, that is cramped living, uh, water pollution, all uh, that is its location on banks of river Hooghly, annual flooding of river Ganges, all this contributes to rise of endemic cholera. It's, it, uh, it becomes epidemic during certain years. 
This is actually from the welcome collection. This is actually very interesting. Ah, uh, Batavia. Can you see Batavia? The on the left, you see lightly shaded region. This is actually swamp, swampy region. You see a marshy area. This you see some paddy fields. You see uh, uh, polders here, rice uh, felder. That is rice fields on the right hand side. Then you see Chinese uh, here. Here you see where I'm pointing the arrow. You see Chinese settlement very close to uh, the North Java coast. It's a uh, you have coastal marshlands, congenial for spread of malaria. And uh, then you have south southward movement of uh, population. That is the fort, the fortified settlement of Batavia gets demolished, and then it moves southwards towards uh, what is today known as Jalan Tengku Umar. So that's uh, very interesting. This is 1845 Batavia Chinese settlement close to the coast and uh, salt paddy and uh, uh, coastal marshland. This is 1918 malariometric survey in uh, Jakarta. In the around that time, you have land improvements for prevention of malaria. Both are from, uh, the second image is from Kai TL. The first one is an open access image from Wiki Wikimedia Commons. Calcutta, now I'll be going back to Calcutta. Calcutta in uh, 1911 had a population of more than 2 million, much of it living in conditions of extreme poverty. What I had told you, and poor sanitation situated in low-lying marshy grounds where water supplies were contaminated by cholera. Calcutta was, was uh, close to a zone of endemic cholera, I again told you. European powers sought to manage cholera in the 19th century. Also referred to Eric Tagliacozzo's work on cholera and histories of health in Southeast Asia, the assigned readings that I had given you. Vast number of pilgrims from Netherlands Indies sailed into the uh, Red Sea. Colonial Verslag, a colonial report for each year, mentioned that residency chiefs were responsible for letting the villagers within the administrative orbits know more about the state of cholera in Mecca. Now turning to colonial Java, we have unreliable statistics. Batavia was the graveyard of Europeans, as Hans Pohl says. Between 1750 and 1820, Java had no famine comparable to the Great Bengal famine, when third of the local population perished. Between 1750 and 1810, there were several occasions when Governor General of Java had to forbid rice exports. Largest killers of 19th century in Java included cholera, fevers, and smallpox. Cholera epidemic in Bengal in 1817 reached Semarang in 1821. Pattern of cholera in Java, sudden eruption in a number of residencies, followed by gradual reduction, followed by second wave. That was less severe, followed by receding outbreak. This is especially true in north coast of Java. It was very much like the Coromandel coast. That is, you have two monsoon seasons, then you have a short dry period, and temperatures rarely dropping below 18 degrees Celsius. So that makes it a truly tropical climate. That gives rise to endemic cholera. See, Norman Owen, Death and Disease in Southeast Asia. The book is available in Jurusan Sejara Library. Smallpox vaccination was the only public health measure in the 19th century in Java. It contributed to lowering mortality, according to Boomgat. See, this is Java, the Department of Health Services vaccinating a woman. This is around uh, 1910. So it was the only uh, way in which the colonial government got to know many villagers, actually. It was a form of state medicine. Case fatality due to smallpox was 15% in the 19th century. I, in my own article, eradicating smallpox in, the, uh, in Indonesia, the archipelagic challenge in health and history, 2010. I note that vaccination was introduced in Java in 1804. That was a time during the Napoleonic occupation of Netherlands. And then they, uh, there was Anglo-French rivalry. Both British and the French were keen to offer smallpox uh, inoculation to Dutch. So smallpox in, uh, vaccination was introduced to Netherlands East Indies during the period of political turmoil around 18, between 1804 and 1815. Very interesting. I have spoken about the linkages between environmental, maritime, and urban history, right? How the three intersect, how you can meaningfully write, uh, connect urban history to wider history of global health. That's what I'm trying to illustrate in today's talk, special lecture. 
Let us look at three case studies since I've compiled since my MA days in 2008. I've spoken about Southeast Asian medical history through case studies of Java, Batavia in particular, and how it intersects with environmental history. More history examples can be given, such as the growth of topical medicine in the Philippines, referred to Warwick Anderson's colonial pathologies. How acceptance of a germ theory of disease was central for Philippines to acquire nationhood. That's his argument. Or Indian read Tamil migration to colonial Ma Malaya in the 19th and 20th century. And how poor living conditions of Tamil laborers in the rubber plantations of Malaya. Lenore Manderson's sickness on the state in colonial Malaya contributed to endemic diseases such as hookworm, TB, or nutritional disorders such as malaria, anemia. This is actually uh, around 1923, you have Rockefeller Foundation work uh, starting in India, in the Dutch East Indies, integration of preventive, curative healthcare, cost-effective public health measures, training of local physicians to take up health responsibilities. It was located at the interstices of colonial medicine and post-colonial health. Focus on maternal healthcare in Java, this photo. Influence of Rockefeller Foundation on colonial medicine, the Dutch East Indies, promotion of Western medicine, germ theory of disease, and but yet enlistment of local population, mobilizing them on health issues, public health demonstration projects like Purwa Karto in Java. So these are very important and how this was appropriated in post-independent times, you should refer to my book. Memeli Hara Jiva Raga Bangsa, it has been translated into Bahasa Indonesia in 2019. The linkages between poverty and disease were first articulated forcefully at the Bandung Conference of Far Eastern Nations on Rural Hygiene in 1937. Now I will be uh, situating environment and medical history within the paradigm of modernization. So the idea of development, so what is that? After World War II, colonialism was discredited in South and Southeast Asia with the independence of Philippines, India, Myanmar, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, between 46 and 48. The common program for social and economic development that would lead developing countries to the of the region to a modernization trajectory prescribed by the West. How did environmental and disease eradication get enmeshed in modernization trajectory? Exploration of natural resources. I'm sorry, exploitation of natural resources. See, for example, Suzanne Moon's discussion of the steel plant in Justice, Geography and Steel in Osiris. Elements of nature were defined as natural resources only if they were of value to industry. For example, Pembangunan in India, fire plan of. In Indonesia, Pembangunan in Indonesia, fire first fire plan of India. How to utilize natural resources? So that was a major component of the first fire plans of Indonesia and India, respectively, in the 50s. In the 60s and 70s, environmentalism was confined as a social movement in Europe and North America. When it reached South Asia and Southeast Asia, it took the form as a social movement in Europe and uh, uh, in a limited form, similar to that of Europe and North America, such as saving large mammalian species, such as tigers, elephants. In some cases, villagers resisted the implementation of natural, national and international plans. In 1990s, the notion of sustainable development gains traction. For example, harvesting fisheries, slowing greenhouse gas emissions. Southeast Asia was a site of global environmentalism. So what is at stake in modernization theory? Indigenous knowledge is undervalued, for example. See, Randall Packard's uh, Global uh, Public Health, he has written a monograph, Intervention into Lives of Other People, published uh, by uh, Cambridge University Press. Also refer to my article, No Nation Can Go Forward When It Is Crippled by Disease, Philippine Science and the Cold War in 1950s, where I speak about the ways in which malaria eradication in Mindanao in southern Philippines was used by President Manuel Roxas to industrialize the island, suppress Huck Balahap rebellion. Again, environmental history opening up ideas, regions for development using malaria and as a means eradication use. Uh, that is interesting. This is the book I was talking to you about. Paul Greeno edited Nature in the Global South, 
environmental projects in south and southeast asia very interesting because it has a south southeast asian focus around 12 to 13 chapters densely written and i used it in my masters referring to paul greenhouse uh, pathogens bug marks and political emergency I would like to point out that India and Bangladesh saved as the last bastions of smallpox after the disease was extirpated in 72 in Indonesia. So how to link environmental and medical history? Paul Greeno's essay is a model case study. That's why I deliberately introduced it in my talk. I don't have the book with me. I have a copy of the chapter, but not the whole book. So whatever I have put on PPT, it is from memory of the 2008 notes and lecture. In both cases, smallpox, I'm sorry, smallpox eradication and tiger conservation. Subalterns, that is subaltern history, history from below, peasants, fishermen, farmers, laborers, they squared off with scientists in debates about conservation. That is, how do you divorce conservation from livelihoods of people? What I was talking to you earlier, in the case of tiger conservation and the Sundarbans, and smallpox eradication in South Asia. Both were a part of a global campaign to conserve tigers and eradicate smallpox. Both campaigns highlighted India's global commitment at a time when the country had angered Western governments over support to Bangladesh, liberation struggle, and detonating a secretly, secretly prepared uh, nuclear bomb in 1974. Smallpox eradication was about extirpating a species, whereas uh, Project Tiger was about conservation of a species. So this is the book. Please take down Paul Greenhouse's chapter, Pathogens, Bug Marks, and Political Emergency, Nature in the Global South, Environmental Projects in South and Southeast Asia. Durham, North Carolina, Duke University Press, 2003. So this is the point that I, uh, Paul Greenhouse makes in this chapter. So what was the smallpox eradication context in India? India implemented its national smallpox eradication program in 1963. It's a very diverse country. Northern India is densely populated. Population of the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh more than exceeds the population of Brazil. So it would be the sixth most populated country on earth. Maharashtra's population equals that of the Philippines. So you, uh, Kerala, the southern state of Kerala has a high population density, but its population is only around 35 million or so. And a large, uh, sizable majority is diasporic, settled in either in Malaya or in uh, Malaysia or in uh, the Persian Gulf states. So it's very interesting to see. And now because of Kerala's aging, you have interstate migration. That's a different story. That is immigration of people from Northern India to uh, poor Northern India to economically rich Southern India. Southern India's per capita is more like Indonesia. Northern India's per capita income is more like Ethiopia. Even those days, it was similar in the 60s. Northern India was more densely populated. It was more populous than Southern India, much higher fertility rate. So for a higher density of population, coincides with, it provides a fertile breeding ground for smallpox. So you have mass vaccination of the entire population. And the problem is interstate migration, for example, in the Indian state of Bihar, Eastern Indian state of Bihar, rich in minerals and forests. You have a lot of immigrant, I'm sorry, migrant labor from other states. And they, it becomes difficult to vaccinate them. So they became, so uh, smallpox was spread through interstate travel in India, particularly in the 60s. Why smallpox was slated for the World Health by the World Health Organization for eradication 58? It has no animal transmission. It is only transmitted from one human to another. Eradication of the disease was globally attainable by 1980, as the disease does not have a known animal reservoir. By 1964, in India, as the mass eradication program was unfolded, national smallpox eradication, migrant workers, fishermen, villagers accounted for bulk of disease transmission. And then you have pilgrimages. For example, Bihar is also the home to Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Jainism is another religion in India that reverses wildlife. 
you have Pavapuri pilgrimage. So there were Jain pilgrims who refused to be vaccinated because there was a feeling that a vaccine was sourced from lymph of a cow. That was at least during the colonial period, but in the post-colonial period, you have freeze dried vaccine and all that invented. So you are convinced Jain pilgrims traveling to Pavapuri. Pavapuri is in Bihar. That is it's a site where Lord Mahavira, the 24th Jain Tirthankara, he was actually a Jain guru who obtained uh, salvation in Pavapuri. So it was actually, uh, they knew that it was a uh, microorganism that had to be extirpated and extirpation of any living organism is contrary to Jain philosophy. Very interesting. So they went on, the, the Jain Muni went on fast and then the WHO team had to convince the Jain Muni to uh, annul the fast. They convinced them that smallpox eradication wasn't the greater common good and all that. So it's, you see how the program had to bend to religious dictates, similar to Indonesia, where vaccination in Ramadan, it was rumored that it would, uh, it would ruin a person's fasting. Then uh, the Indonesian government in the new order had to cite a dictate from Ulama Sahih Muslim Islam to say that uh, vaccination in Ramadan was equal to amputation of an infected limb. So that encouraged uh, vaccination during Ramadan. So you see how religious uh, sentiments of people have to be taken into account. Between 67 and 72, in India shifted from mass vaccination using mass vaccination to uh, that is uh, ma of uh, uninfected population to using surveillance. Surveillance is using smallpox detection card like this. That is, this is a child having smallpox. The, the uh, worker would go from house to house. Do you have symptoms of rash, fever? Then uh, tick, tick, tick. If a child is found, he or she would be reported to the authorities. The whole house would be quarantined. If anybody in the family was in, uninfected, they would be vaccinated. So ring contact, vaccination of all ring contact of uninfected people. And then uh, uh, that is so, uh, containment. So that is very interesting. So this is actually sourced from Michigan Library. And uh, the strategy was pioneered in Indonesia, by the way, that is in Indonesia, that is a shift from surveillance to containment, uh, from uh, mass vaccination to surveillance and containment using smallpox recognition cards. And smallpox was uh, eradicated in Indonesia in 1974 at a time when the Bihar Health Ministry was embroiled in a controversy with the WHO because Bihar government wanted to implement smallpox mass vaccination while WHO wanted surveillance and containment. And Karan Singh, the health minister, had to tread a delicate line between the Bihar health ministry on one hand and the WHO on the other. So this is very interesting. This is Prime Minister Indira Gandhi with a tiger. Project Tiger was implemented in 1973. Uh, Project Tiger reserves are administered by state governments, whereas central government provides funding, spearheaded by International Union for Conservation of Nature and Minister of Health and Family Planning at that time, Karan Singh. Why was he involved? You see, if you see India, where wildlife reserves are located, many of them are located in the erstwhile princely states that shared, in the, that experienced indirect British rule. So where are most of these princely states located? Rajasthan, today's Rajasthan, Ranthambore and Sariska, major tiger reserves near Delhi. They were Maharaja's hunting ground. Then you have a wildlife sanctuary in Gujarat, Sasangir, lion reserve. It was actually the hunting ground of the Muslim ruler of Junagar. It, it was it is the last bastion of the Asiatic lion. So, uh, Karan Singh hails from a royal family. He was close to the Nehru in, Nehru's Indira Gandhi and her father. So he was in a good position. He had international links. He mediated with WHO and Bihar state. He was Minister of Health and Family Planning in his capacity. He mediated with Bihar state government and the WHO when the lack, uh, former failed to collaborate with the intensified program of smallpox eradication. And in the IUC and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, their ideas pioneered in the US. The Yellowstone National Park, for example, was exported to India. That is an uh, ecosystem approach for conservation of wildlife, where vast areas of tiger reserves were sequestered and off limits to villages. Project Tiger gained momentum in 1975 when Indira Gandhi pro proclaimed the political emergency, suspension of parliamentary democracy. What happened at this time? Increasing poverty, unemployment, inflation 
economic crisis following the indo bang pakistan war uh, uh, independence of bangladesh us sanctions so in india had to reassert itself on the world stage as a global leader for wildlife conservation and eradication of smallpox there was criticism in the new york times for example as a big criticism how is it that india has uh old how is it that, that india has explored a nuclear device but cannot control smallpox so these kinds of issues so indira gandhi took it as a personal affront so as to say so in the project tiger pug marks were used for tiger census but again now we actually what has happened is by the pug marks tiger droppings what is the best method to determine number of tigers in the given sanctuary then there are targets set to increase tiger population so that sets one state against another first full eviction of tigers from peripheral zone you see it in gujarat all the time in the sasangir asiatic lion reserve tiger attack on uh, wild animals poisoning of wells and many tigers get killed in the process lack of support from rural areas due to human animal conflict high density of population in uh, the sasangir forest of gujarat for example it is located in the semi arid region in western india and the biggest problem is population density hyper density of cattle high density of animals 328 animals in a small area sanctuary dense vegetation uh, grows in the monsoon season so that makes it difficult for lions to procreate so they colonize outer areas like the sea coast and that brings them into conflict with people fishermen as well as animal herders or maldaris very interesting it's a very interesting aspect in india even in indonesia you will have it i'm sure particularly in sumatra or in uh, sulawesi or in kalimantan that is the human orangutan conflict for example especially in palm oil zones So now I'll be speaking about last topic is uh, environmental discourse in Indonesia, legacy of colonialism. So what you see is territoriality in Indonesian forest management. The Dutch passed the Domindar Clearing legislation in 1870. So what is this legislation? Bringing adat or communal land in Java under the purview of the state, but private land would remain private property. Very difficult, right? That is free land that had no native claimants under the ownership of the state in the Dutch East Indies would pass on to the crown. Domain work clearing and free enforced colonial civil service assumptions about the strict separation of forests from fields for conceptual, practical, and legal purposes. Teak forests or hutan jati were demarcated as state property. Domain work clearing was passed in Java. But its legality was challenged by the regional colonial administration in Kalim Borneo. So you see, the colonial administration was not a monolithic group. You see differences between Java and Borneo. So now, what happens after independence? What was en environmental conservation in Sukarno era? There was negligible investment in Kalimantan. Number one, hostility to foreign investment in general. Indonesian ICC of the economy, Barbiri the Atas Kaki Sundiri, or standing on one's two feet. In the early 60s, uh, Western Kalimantan was the theater of confrontation between Sukarno and Ma Malaysia, because Sukarno feared an imperialist encirclement of Indonesia. Basic agrarian law, 1960, Undang Undang Dasar tentang Agraria. Eliminated specific customary differences between tanah adat, customary land, and other kinds of property, private property. Claimants for tanah adat could sell it legally to other Indonesian citizens. Single legal court for administration was seen as a unifying factor because Sukarno tried to bring the nation together. Right? There was differences, political differences between Islamists but uh, and the uh, Muslimi. So he tried to. Uh, he had to tread very carefully on all fronts, including health, the environment. Diminished the authority of indigenous people over ethnic territory for, that they claimed as their own under Dutch, specifically Kalimantan. Forests now coded as state land, even when boundaries were not formally demarcated. Local rights to forest produce was recognized, but territorial rights of individual uh, communities. Over the land was not recognized in the Sukarno era, so it becomes a difficult period for environmental conservation. 
there were inconsistencies in the undang undang dasar agraria implementation undang undang uh, pokok dasar agraria recognized claims made by individuals who could prove that they had owned and managed specific pro products forest products such as honey trees but product rights grant people did not earn them territory rights which i was telling you so colonial legacy of forest as territorial domain continues this also continues in the new order era at this time you see concessions granted to logging companies state mapping exercises on forest land and then you what you have in sumatra and kalimantan is adat is recognized nominally by the state but when tana adat conflicts with national interest or state ideology state ideology remains supreme so that is what you see in papua you see in uh, ache you see in sulawesi you see in kalimantan you see in sumatra you see in nusa tenggara see nancy lee pelusos chapter nature in the global south for further details there is saying in indonesia that uh, if you sell durian from the forest in especially in kalimantan it is like selling your grandmother so uh, development experts particularly from odebaru would dismiss this as grandmother's uh, wisdom or they would dismiss it as, as hearsay but when you think about it from a anthropological perspective a holistic perspective selling durians is like selling your grandmother it means that you clear the forest you use fertilizers there is contamination of the soil durian also has cultural significance in kalimantan so you that cultural significance is obliterated in favor of a commercial gain these are some of the things we have to think into account when we think about nature in the global south how environmentalism is reduced to just conserving large mammals wwf for example or iucn for example what you see on national geographic but cultural aspects for example creation of sacred grounds in india especially in rajasthan we have all over india particularly but i would like to talk about rajasthan very very briefly your sacred grounds acacia cineraria it is called top kgri uh, the pods of acacia cineraria they provide grazing fodder for cattle the pods are consumed by people during drought so tropical thorn forest is revered as an abode of lord vishnu by the local desert community of bishnoi the women uh, do not use for, for uh, trees for fuel instead what they do is they use uh, animal dung dried animal cow dung as fuel deer for example even if they attack crops they are tolerated because sometimes they eat weeds as well black buck their dung contributes to soil fertility orphan deer are breast fed by women so these kinds of issues you see that is uh, mother nature uh, that is uh, black bucks uh, sacred grounds they are protected by bishnois once you had a case where bollywood actor salman khan was prosecuted by bishnois for illegally shooting down a black buck in a nature reserve in the thar desert very interesting now a last point is disaster medicine and environmental history so archipelagic southeast asia is vulnerable to climate change uh, global warming you see floods in jakarta surabaya bangkok hanoi then you have uh, droughts in nusa tenggara particularly central myanmar particularly then you have uh, volcanic eruptions in philippines so it goes against the grain of western medicine that is a holistic perspective greatest good of greatest number instead of curing curing a patient who's suffering distress due to an earthquake or a volcanic eruption prevention of illness for example when there's a flood water ailments or dengue so sanitizing water sources to prevent dengue that kind of issues crop up when there's environmental medical services mobilized during an emergency particularly in southeast asia after the tsunami nachi that's what happened counseling services but that should get more emphasis i believe in southeast asia indonesia for example there are only 1200 counts uh, psychiatrists for a population of 250 million people as hans pols has repeatedly pointed out in his seminars for more on disaster medicine and environmental history linkages see bank of chapter and tim harper and sunil amrits edited volume histories of health in southeast asia what are the new emerging threats zoonotic diseases drug resistant malaria strains on the myanmar thailand border 
multi resistant drug resistant tb in mid 2000s around 2006 7 indonesian minister of health refuses to share even influenza samples with the who citing the notion of viral sovereignty a notion that was subsequently invoked by china in the current covid 19 crisis in 2020 when it refused to share covid 19 samples with the who see celia loves 2019 article in medical anthropology theory so what happens is in 2000 the mid 2000s indonesia especially west java was at the epicenter of an avian influenza pandemic an outbreak i'm sorry at that time the indonesian minister of health siti fadila supari expressed apprehensions that uh, viral samples uh, obtained by who from both humans as well as avian influenza from indonesia uh, constituted national patrimony that who uh, collaboration with uh, uh, no art is another pharmaceutical spent against the principle of uh, generic drugs that is making drugs accessible to countries most affected at a nominal price. So Indonesia exhibited its uh, leadership on the global stage, particularly in the mid 2000s. And the notion of viral sovereignty was for subsequently invoked by China. That is after the Wuhan outbreak, China did not share its viral sequencing samples with the WHO, citing the same notion of viral sovereignty. What are the new concepts in environmental and medical history? Planetary health recognizes anthropogenic disturbances in the ecosystem, disruption of global climate system, pollution, rapid diversity loss, reconfiguration of global biogeochemical cycles, including carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, pervasive changes in land use, freshwater scarcity, and scarcity of urban, I'm sorry, arable land. Climate change increases vulnerability to infectious diseases and natural hazards, such as floods, hurricanes, droughts, and heat waves. These disasters affect physical and mental well-being, including nutritional outcomes. For example, how COVID affects nutritional outcomes, or how does heat wave in uh, Gujarat affect mental health, food security, and uh, how, what was the cultural perspective on a heat wave in Gujarat? These kinds of issues. How does desertification in India contribute to heat wave in very, uh, I'm sorry, in semi uh, desert areas or in urban areas, particularly Ahmedabad, located close to the, on the margins of the Great Indian Desert? These kinds of issues. Then to conclude, limits of modernization theory with respect to applying environmental philosophies appropriated from the West to South and Southeast Asia. Case studies from India and Indonesia respectively highlight the significance of using either subaltern approach, that is if we can use oral history to document resistance, popular resistance to vaccination or creation of sanctuaries for protection of wildlife, that is subaltern approach. Or longitude, continuities and change. For example, you analyze flooding through history or heat waves through a historical approach. How did the people in the past think of heat waves? How does heat wave aggravate with global warming? How does heat wave affect food security? Things like that. How does heat wave exacerbate outbreaks of measles? Things like that. Or how does it aggravate outbreaks of waterborne diseases? Or how does it lead to water insecurity? Overlaps between environmental and medical history, Indian Ocean as disease zone, and then about the notion of planetary health, a holistic perspective that can, consists of thinking of zoonotic, uh, that is well being, human well being, animal, I'm sorry, planetary well being. Connecting the dots, that is a big challenge. That is, there are people I know in Jerusalem, Sejara, and Fakultas, Ilmu Budaya, who deal with diverse themes. For example, flooding in Surabaya, Nulak Manane, cultural practices for preventing paddy piss in Bali, or there are, there are cases where people speak about uh, environmental history of uh, Besuki. So how do you link it to the wider histories of the Indian Ocean? That's a challenge, connecting dots in, in Indonesian environmental history. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, yeah terima kasih, Vivek. Penjelasan yang cukup luas dan panjang uh, mengenai tentang pendekatan uh, di dalam uh, kesehatan dan uh, lingkungan. ya. Dan... <coughs> 
saya kira ini cukup menarik ya bagi kita yang terutama uh, mahasiswa uh, our student in Indonesia mengenai bagaimana ini menjadi sebuah hal yang bisa dilakukan karena ini menjadi sebuah uh, satu kesatuan sebenarnya kalau kita berbicara mengenai lingkungan pasti akan kita bicara mengenai hal yang lainnya salah satunya adalah kesehatan dan <tuh> ternyata uh, Pak Vivek tidak hanya bicara mengenai kasus yang ada di Indonesia, tapi Pak Vivek juga mencoba untuk mengkomparasikan dan mungkin bisa dikatakan tadi yang penjelasan di awal adalah bicara secara lebih dalam konteks pendekatan global. Bahwa sebenarnya ketika mengkaji sebuah persoalan masalah penyakit kolera, bukan hanya di Batavia, bukan hanya di Indonesia, tetapi juga ada di India dan juga ada di tempat-tempat yang lain. Dan itu saya pikir juga membuka pemahaman knowledge kita bahwa ketika mempelajari hubungan pendekatan pendekatan kesehatan dan lingkungan tidak hanya terbatas pada konteks lokal, tapi kita bisa mengkomparasikan, mengkombinasikan dengan yang ada di luar lokal atau Indonesia. Baik, uh, Uh, excuse me, Alfred. Maybe I translate with your presentation with my Indonesia bahasa. <laughs> saya uh, so uh, saya mengundang uh, bapak ibu peserta webinar rekan-rekan mahasiswa yang ingin bertanya silahkan bisa raise hand uh, atau bisa uh, bertanya langsung dengan Pak Vivek Nelekantan. <laughs> silahkan. Oke, okay. Pak Sarkawi selamat datang. <laughs> ya, uh, halo, silakan ya. Pak Vivek, uh, Pak Sarkawi. Uh, halo Vivek, how are you? Senang sekali ketemu dengan Pak Sarkawi. Sorry? I'm very happy to meet with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I a long time not hear from you. I hope uh, one day. We can meet again in Surabaya. I'm very excited about that. Uh, It's a second home. Thank you for making yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second okay, home. Thank you. <laughs> so this this time uh, the quota program. Maybe next time the young professor like uh, uh, Horton. Mm, thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I cannot join this interesting lecture from the beginning. So <coughs> I just want to. I, I would like to thank to Dr. Vivek again and again to share your knowledge with us. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, your third time giving lectures in the Department of History in Universitas Erlangga, yeah, Bu Moria. Ini ketiga kalinya Bu Pak Vivek memberi kuliah. Ya, yeah, saya... Uh, I have one uh, simple question, Pak Vivek. I just want to know the progress of medical history in India. So maybe you, you can compare with uh, Southeast Asia and India. Yeah. Thank you, Lutmur. Thank you, Pak Sarkawi. Actually, Indian medical history is a very wide field, especially colonial medicine, it's overwhelmed developed, I would say. There's so much written about Bombay, about Calcutta port cities in general. A lot written about maritime histories, about maritime medical knowledge, for example. There's also uh, work done on diaspora, Indian diaspora, Indian East Indian doctors. But I think there's more need to be done about role of WHO in India. There's some work done on smallpox eradication, but more needs to be done on 1950 or 70s for that matter, <coughs> similar to Indonesia. Very similar situation. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Pak Vivek. Terima kasih, Pak Sarkawi. <coughs> Uh, saya mengundang yang lainnya untuk uh, apa bertanya menanyakan ini apa mengenai bagaimana sebenarnya persoalan kesehatan dan uh, lingkungan misalnya apakah itu perlu perlu menjadi sebuah metode yang baru metodologi yang baru di dalam pengkajian 
penulisan sejarah misalnya atau apa apapun Anda bisa bertanya dengan Pak Vivek. Kebetulan Pak Vivek ini seperti yang sudah disampaikan oleh Pak Sarkawi eh, pernah eh, stay di sini di Surabaya selama beberapa waktu ya. Dan uh, sambil menunggu yang lainnya, ini ada satu pertanyaan. We have one questions from okay. our student feedback. You can see in the chat room uh, from Rama Narendra. M mungkin Rama Narendra ada di ruang chat ini. Uh, bisa off cam. Is, uh, you can see and you can. Yeah. Um, Historically, yeah. whether there was any difference between Indian Muslims and other denominations, Hindu Sikhs, on how they perceive their environment, I think no. In India, for example, if you think of the Sundarbans as an ecological zone, tigers are very much feared. They are worshipped as banobibi by Muslims, by Hindus as well. So you see, there's really no difference because Islam was highly, in India was highly influenced by Sufi, Sufism. So really there was no difference as such. Jains, for example, biocentric theory of life. Buddhists, again, biocentric theory of life. Biocentric, that is primacy of life. That is, I was talking about Adam and Eve, how God had created the world for Adam to enjoy, right? and dominate, but that is not the case in Indic religions. That's very interesting. So Islam in India is very much influenced by currents, local currents, by Sufism. So local deities such as Mano Bibi, there is an integration of Islam and shamanism. So as to say, even if you see Kyrgyzstan, for example, you see the local shaman practices Tengarism, it integrates well with Islam. So you see spirits being venerated, or you see legends like Uh, Manas, uh, war of 40 kings in Kyrgyzstan, things like that. So it's very interesting to see how culture interacts with religion and how it comes in uh, helping to conserve the environment. Baik, bagaimana Raman Narinda? Uh, are you satisfied for this about perfect uh, answer? Halo, Rama, are you stay? Okay, uh, she say with the chat room, uh, thank you for your, your um, the answers. Yeah. <laughs> maybe he cannot come to our chat, uh, to our room because maybe the connection speed well, maybe. So Alfian, okay, Alfian, uh, this is our student too. Uh, please, time is yours, Alfian. Silakan, yes, Alfian. Uh, apa suara saya terdengar, Bu? Ya, silah, sangat baik sekali. Ya, yeah, uh, uh, maybe this is a question for for uh, this that is a bit far from the material presentation of Mr. Vivek. Uh, for the introduction, maybe all the participants here know this from YouTube or from social media. And yes, it is about food that is made unhealthy by Indian people, in our opinion. For example, a uh, penny puri, uh, which is hand processed and sewn in public, and that is quite <laughs> disgusting for me. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and yeah. <laughs> in our mind, uh, sorry to say, maybe it is a very dirty habit for me or for some people in our society. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, I keep thinking about one question that is in my brain and to question this phenomenon. And my question is, what is the basis of pet habit in India food, or maybe Mr. Vivek can explain his cultural cultural root in India and and how do Indian view this unhealthy habit? This. So uh, let me come to yeah. Alfian Santoso's uh, point. I think Pani Puri that is actually more of a stereotype. I would say the issue in India is here, close human animal proximity. That gives rise to multiple airborne zoonotic diseases, 
similar to Indonesia. Let us say that, put it that way, right? That is even in the past, for example, uh, during the plague epidemic, you see in Bombay unhealthy living for the conditions in workers quarters, people were living close to each other. If you read Bernard first account of Bombay, 1926, you see how laborers quarters, they are closely clustered to each other. Well, water is contaminated people, Separately, the Indonesia, Orang Mandi, Orang Mingunakan, Air Sumur, Untuk, Dapur, Dan Lane Lane. So, because of this, it is very interesting. Very interesting to see how waterborne diseases spread. Then, uh, rats, for example, that is uh, sacks of rice stored in, haphazardly stored in jute sacks that can cause plague, right? rat infestation of houses. But what happened is the British around 1896 to combat the 1897 to combat the Bombay plague, they introduced the Epidemic Disease Act. So the state governor had uh, empowered the district collector to arrest any person violating Epidemic Disease Act. Any house suspected of harboring plague could be searched, fumigated, etc. So that the problem is that archaic colonial law was implemented in control of COVID-19 in India, Epidemic Disease Act of 1897 or Section 144 of Indian Penal Code that dates back to British legal system. So those kinds of issues, like if you, uh, that is past, how, to what extent, what are the lessons we can learn from, from the past? Or does it only provide a context to understand current situation those kinds of questions you need to understand from learning history i think that's what i think you should ask pani puri i think that is the question of environment and disease for example close proximity between uh, humans then there's no real space for shops so they set it up on the street and that's how it's like similar, similar to pedagang kaki lima yeah set up on the street and then tropical heat and then you see fruits, the rujak, it decays, things like that. Yes, uh, thank you for the answer. Mungkin saya, Ibu, ya silahkan Ibu Yuli. Uh, uh, excuse me, good morning, Mr. Vivik. Uh, I am Julia C from medical faculty. Uh, I want to ask you one question. Why does malaria in Indonesia, especially Kalimantan, you know, maybe Papua, uh, have difficult to be controlled? There are still many cases there. Please explain the other countries in the world that can eliminate malaria. Thank you. Thank you, Bu Julia. See, it's a very helpful question because in Indonesia, what I saw in my own research in the 50s was that anophelin species and plasmodium, it developed resistance to insecticide DDT because DDT was used in combination with dieldrin in the fields of banyamas. So what happens is to bait as a bait, fishing bait. So that's the reason it was used in small doses. So plasmodium it developed resistance to DDT in the 50s. In Kalimantan, what happened in the 60s was low uh, confrontation with Malaysia, yeah? 1963, yes. so malaria eradication was suspended. So combination of suspension of malaria spraying operations, development of plasmodium species to uh, resistance to DDT, chloroquine resistance in Cambodia, Thailand border. These factors, they contribute to resistance of malaria to conventional pesticides. Bagaimana Ibu Yuliasi? <coughs> Mungkin ada yang bisa dipertanyakan kembali. Terima kasih. Yeah. Thanks for your good explanation. Ya, uh, untuk sekedar informasi Ibu Yuliase sebenarnya uh, Pak Vivek juga menyinggung di dalam bukunya, salah satu bukunya kalau tidak salah uh, mengenai kesehatan di era Soekarno. Uh, is it true Vivek, uh, Pak Vivek? Yeah, that's your book in the last published in from Gramedia. Yeah, 
Uh -huh. You can explain to uh, Dr. Yulia Seh mengenai uh, your book that uh, uh, mengenai malaria pada zaman uh, Soekarno. Uh, saya lupa ibu judulnya, tetapi nanti saya akan uh, sampaikan ke ibu mengenai judul uh, dari uh, buku Pak Vivek. Ya, terima kasih. Baik, uh, ya sambil menunggu yang lain, uh, kita masih punya banyak waktu sampai pukul 11. Silahkan yang ingin bertanya kepada Pak Vivek. Oke, okay. so I will answer Bu Juliasi's question about my book. In mm -hmm. Media, it was published by it is a translated version of my original monograph, Science, Public Health and Nation Building in Sukarno Era, Indonesia. Memelihara jiwa raga bangsa. Bagaimana Indonesia menggunakan pembasmian malaria untuk rekonstruksi manusia Indonesia yang baru dengan prinsip manipulur stek pada 50-an. That's one, one aspect that I cover. The second aspect is the way in which malaria eradication was used by the US, particularly under President Dwight Eisenhower to to purchase the loyalties of third world countries, particularly Indonesia, Philippines, and India in its fight against uh, communism because poverty and disease was seen as a breeding ground of communism. So Indonesia appropriated the notion of uh, developing uh, outer islands for cultivation. That is, Sukarno believed that outer islands uh, and uh, Java could support a population of 250 million people. Indonesia was rich in resources to open the land for cultivation. You had to clear the land of malaria. So DDT was used, but he wanted to take aid only on his own terms, not according to American terms. So those kinds of issues, delicate politics played a major role in suspension of American aid to Indonesia because Indonesia wanted to uh, see malaria eradication as part of its nation building endeavor, Pembanguna. Malaria and uh, uh, Pembasmi and Malaria di Indonesia uh, berhubungan dengan ide pembangunan. Tapi di Amerika, Amerika menggunakan uh, malaria untuk uh, pembasmian atau menghapus ide komunisme. Ada kontradiksi di sini karena Soekarno menggunakan bantuan komunis dan Islamist Party. So you see? Those kinds of issues around 59, the Cold War peaks in Indonesia turns hot. You can see so as to say, especially the, with the implementation of the malaria eradication campaign. That's a major feature of my book. That is chapter four, the campaign against big four endemic diseases. So you see tuberculosis, malaria, yaws, and leprosy. I also speak about drug resistant TB in my book, Bu Julia C. You may be interested in that as well, because Indonesia was among the first countries where malaria resistance, uh, that, I'm sorry, the anophylline resistance to DDT was first demonstrated scientifically by the Malaria Institute in Jakarta. Scientific uh, research in Indonesia was thorough in the 50s, but organization of the campaign was hazard. That was the problem. That is, for example, who would provide funding to the provincial governments or how would the regional governments get funding for malaria eradication? Those kinds of issues. Decentralization of governance poses threats to disease eradication today as well as it was during the 50s. Like supplies run out, then the WHO supplies run out, then you have to route orders from Semarang, from Yogyakarta to Semarang, Semarang to Java, Java to Delhi, Delhi to uh, Geneva. Those kinds of issues, CRO to Geneva, those World Health Organization regional office to Geneva, those kinds of complex issues. So that eliminates uh, coordination. So that makes coordinated activity difficult in health, even though epidemiological studies from Indonesia were thorough in the 50s, because it was the first country where DDT resistance was demonstrated. That the second largest malaria eradication campaign in the world after India. Very interesting and very important chapter, not only in Indonesian, but also global history, the Indonesian malaria eradication campaign. So apart from that, you can also refer to my, I have used a lot of Sukarno speeches in my work, like how revolutionary rhetoric gets into health. For example, in Indonesia, scientists say, that is, uh, we do not get a chance, there was misuse of vehicles used in malaria eradication campaign given by USAID and WHO regional office for Southeast Asia to mediate, to use the 
good offices of the Ministry of Health to get the people on ground comply with WHO directives. So it was a very complex situation. Ministry of Health, uh, uh, Prime Minister Juanda, WHO Regional Director for Southeast Asia, playing the middle ground, the brokering ground between provincial health authorities and doctors on one hand. And on the other hand, you have Geneva, USAID, those kinds of issues uh, surface in my book political history, integration with the history of medicine. But this is a new approach, seeing urban history and environmental history from the lens of medicine. So Neil Amrit's work is the first step in that direction. It is implicit, the links are implicit. Paul Greenough's chapter that I highlighted, pathogen, bug, bug mark, and emergency, highlight the explicit linkages, how you can link tiger conservation and smallpox eradication to the concept of development and how development practices in the West are so different from the non-West. For example, you have uh, sacred grouse in Bali. That is, sacred grouse are uh, trees in the midst of a field where you offer uh, food to spirits, ancestral spirits. But what happens when these grouse are taken over by state saying that they are no man's land or when trees are felled? Those kinds of issues we have to think about when we think about sustainable forestry, when you think about developing plantations. So we have to think, think in terms of uh, local cultures, not just in terms of sustainable development. We need to think more in terms of planetary health, a holistic approach that involves humans, biotic and abiotic factors of the environment, so as to say. It's a very new concept, the concept of planetary health. It came about in 2015 with the Lancet and Rockefeller Foundation. Menarik ya Ibu Yuliasih nanti bisa ke ke kolaborasi dengan Vivek untuk meneliti mengenai malaria. Ya, yeah, I'll find that book at Gramedia. Gramedia is not far yeah. from my home. Terima kasih Ibu Mudiati. Sama-sama Ibu. Uh, satu pertanyaan mungkin yang berkaitan masih dengan malaria from Pak Laude Rabani. Uh, Pak Laude, I invite you to ask Pak Vivek, maybe. Halo. Ya, saya ada satu pertanian mengapa malaria di Papua lebih berbahaya daripada di Java. Terima kasih. So I think the main problem in I, I cannot talk about Papua, okay? But I can talk about outer islands versus Java. And I can talk about the 50s and I will take it from there. That is what happens is in uh, pada dalam lima puluhan, ya, Papua di luar Indonesia, meski di Tangan Belanda. So around 63, 64, it becomes a part of Indonesia. And then you have uh, political uncertainties. Then Suharto era, you have centralization of disease eradication campaigns. You have malaria eradication campaigns in different provinces of Indonesia. You have network of puskesmas. But again, you have... Uh, after the decentralization, Papua, uh, Dera, Dera Papua, Belumada, Dana, Untuk, Pembasmian, Penyakit, Penyakit, Menula, Tapi ada Biaya dari Pada, Dari, Pemerintah Pusat, Ya, Ada Belumada, Koordinasi Pada, Era, Decentralization, Khususnya, Di, Pulau Luar, Java. So decentralization is a mixed blessing in Indonesian public health. Kadang kadang, uh, decentralization project jahit solusi yang specific untuk masala penyakit menular. Tapi kadang kadang ada masala. Karena koordinasi, belum ada koordinasi di antara uh, pusat, daerah dan provinsi karena decentralization. So that is what I would like to say. It is not specific to Papua, but it is specific to most of the outer islands of Indonesia. Oh, yeah. Uh, baik, uh, Pak Laude mungkin uh, ada pertambahan untuk pertanyaan Pak Vivek. Uh, terima kasih, Bu Mur. Uh, selamat bertemu, Vivek. <laughs> Senang. Uh, apakah ada hubungannya dengan lingkungan, Vivek? Uh, karena di Afrika... Uh, 
efek dari malaria ini hampir-hampir sama dengan Papua dan sampai hari ini ada kawan yang hampir seluruh hidupnya uh, didedik, didedikasikan untuk selalu menambah imun atau daya tahan tubuh uh, karena kalau dia terlambat makan atau uh, apa uh, daya tahan tubuhnya turun uh, malaria itu akan datang uh, seperti itu atau memang karena belum ada obat yang karena malaria di Papua sampai hari ini masih uh, sesuatu yang menakutkan uh, padahal dari dana kesehatan yang uh, di keluarkan oleh baik pemerintah Indonesia maupun berbagai organisasi kesehatan tampaknya belum mendapat efek yang apa signifikan untuk merubah pola pikir orang-orang yang berkunjung ke Papua. Kira tambahan tambahannya begitu, terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Karabani. Ini sangat menarik pertanyaan. Di Indonesia ada puskesmas. Pak zaman sekarang, tapi masalah desentralisasi karena untuk implementasi satu rencana malaria belum ada koordinasi di antara satu wilayah dan kedua ya karena topografi Papua sangat sulit. Then you have resistensi melawan DDT ya, plasmodium, parasite plasmodium mempunyai resistensi melawan insektisida DDT karena ini juga ada malaria masih di Papua. Because you see, resistance to DDT impairs the functioning of uh, malaria eradication. So it was held as a magic bullet atau peluru ajaib pada 50-an. Tapi sekarang ada masalah untuk membasmian malaria dengan insecticide DDT. Tapi kalau DDT insecticide uh, datang ke air putih ada masalah kanker, banyak masalah kesehatan. So I think it is a combination of understaffing of public health facilities, underfinancing, and also decentralization. That is, how do you implement a policy? How do you coordinate between different regencies, different forget regencies, villages of Papua? They may be miles apart. Some of them may be just be reachable on foot. Those kinds of issues. How do you spread the word of eradication? How do you get the people to cooperate? For example, there may be some, let me tell you about the example of Penyakit Chachar. Kaltika saya di S2 di University of Iowa, saya riset tentang Penyakit Chachar di Indonesia, khususnya di Pulau Sulawesi. Di Sulawesi, ada satu mitos bahwa uh, uh, that is uh, Penyakit Chachar adalah satu firman dari Uh, it was it was a king's disease atau satu raja penyakit raja kalau satu orang terjangkit dengan penyakit cacar mereka dapat makan yang uh, dingin uh, uh, seperti nia papaya daun papaya atau cucumber uh, or you say fruits so a person would be fed uh, cooling foods Jauh dari nyamuk, so he or she would be given a place to sleep. Then that door, jauh dari nyamuk, so these kinds of issues. That is bad air would spread smallpox. Ada berbeda, pikiran berbeda orang bugi berbeda dari pada WHO pada enam puluhan. So people in Makassar they resisted the WHO when it implemented a program of surveillance. And containment, surveillance, then containment. Penche gahan penyakit cacar dengan vaksinasi yang selektif dan isolasi orang yang terjangkit dengan cacar. So this is a problem in Makassar. So and and then there was a case where vaccinators were attacked with knives in Makassar. So these kinds of issues where you do not take the aspirations of the local people, where you do not take the into account traditional beliefs of healing. This is what happens when there's a disconnect between what is implemented in Geneva and what is happening on the ground. That is why planetary health has to go beyond sustainable development, beyond global health, beyond addressing issues of poverty. What you're seeing in countries like Austria, in countries like Sweden, snowballing of COVID-19, yeah? 
highly educated population, good public health system, booster vaccines. So vaccine resistant COVID strains, that is what it is rumored about. So how do you get people to wear masks, particularly in Melbourne? Because Karanadi Melbourne Spark Rabani, Sayam Lihat Bahwa Hanya Orang Yang Sakit Menggunakan Masker. Tapi Orang Yang Sehat Seperti Kita Tidak Ada Belum Ada Menggunakan Masker. So they are attack people who uh, are forced to wear masks. They attack healthy people. They attack those. So those kinds of issues happened in Melbourne as well. So I think we need to take uh, cultural beliefs regarding health, illness, when you design a public health policy. Environment also has to play a role because say, for example, in Kalimantan or say, for example, in some hilly parts of Sumatra, smallpox was personified again as a king's disease. That is, there were rituals to, uh, uh, that is, uh, expatiate smallpox, expunge smallpox, that is, through rivers, actually, expunge smallpox through rivers. There was ritual because it was believed by certain dire groups that smallpox was brought in from outside. So if you can read, if you if you can get an access to Han Nepen's uh, book, it is published by KITLV Press. So it also, it, it relates smallpox to the environment, that is, to... Uh, riverine trade in Kalimantan or that is upland lowland in Sumatra that is is banished to the lowlands in Sumatra. So those kinds of issues. People go upland when there is small tox, things like that. So we need to take into account environment as well for accounting for how diseases spread because uh, demography by itself doesn't make sense. I think we need to take into account cultural beliefs of the people to understand how diseases spread incidence prevalence. So with that, we can then determine from where it origins because most of the contact in Sumatra comes from lowland. Same with Kalimantan, similar in the case with Sulawesi. Okay, thank you, Vivek. Begitu, Pak Rani. Ya, terima kasih, Vivek. Thank you. Sama-sama. Terima kasih, Pak. Jadi, ada lagi uh, yang ingin bertanya, kalau misalnya tidak ada, <coughs> karena kami akan uh, ada webinar lagi. So, uh, satu closing statement saja dari Vivek, short your closing statement to give us about the um, health and environment in <coughs> methodology in our history in Indonesia. Please. Thank you, Bumur. I think... Mm -hmm. First, I think I, I really appreciate the fact that I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Universitas Airlangga is among the top 500 global universities, surpassing several American universities as well. That's a real achievement. It highlights the diversity of research undertaken in uh, Jerusalem Sejara and Fakultas Ilmu Budaya. And we should encourage more such interdisciplinary ventures and international ventures. I'm really, really happy to note this development, QS rankings, development. And uh, I think I would like to conclude by stating that we need to connect the dots. One big strength of Indonesian history, particularly history of medicine and environmental history is we have so much of diversity. So for example, women and plague in Solo or uh, uh, leprosy in venereal disease in Surabaya flooding in uh, Surabaya, or someone else would have written a wonderful article on Jember, Basuki, Tiger Reserve. But how do you relate this to non-Western environmental thought? And, and how do you relate this to global environmental thought? And what issues emerge when you deal with these thoughts? Where, what are the shortcomings of development and how history can inform practice? These kinds of issues, I think we need to encourage more debates within Indonesia on these kinds of practical issues, like how history can inform current forestry policy. New Order era had some good ideas like sustainable development, but sustainable development by itself is not enough for conserving orangutan or for conserving forestry. We need to take into account people's sentiments as well. For example, in Kalimantan, there's a saying, if you sell durian, it is like selling your grandmother or rubber is our rice. For a scientist, what? Rubber is rice? Rubbish. But for a person in Kalimantan, rubber, it is black gold. You sell rubber, you get rice. So you see those kinds of issues we need to take into account. Livelihood issues while designing health policy. So planetary health, that is uh, 
animal interconnectedness between animal human health for example think let us think of the tsunami that was before the emergence of planetary health as a episteme 2004 what happened in the indian ocean tsunami in the indian ocean tsunami aceh was worst affected also kadalur district of tamil nadu was affected equally badly so see the interconnected histories of the bay of bengal or the interconnected histories between india and indonesia through the bay of bengal see the kind similar kind of issues that cropped up trauma lack of mental health professionals to deal with emergency situations those kinds of issues so i think we need to have a new methodology such as integrating planetary health with history of medicine environmental history and urban history because global warming is also a global threat like chennai for this year suffered from severe flooding like it received around 80 inches of rainfall 40% more than average annual average mumbai received twice its annual average rainfall it's like jakarta's rain twice the annual average rainfall of jakarta this year we received and there was banjir and all that so what is the reason it has been occurring for three years we had rainy season till december this year now kamarao omausim thinking has started so climate change probably let us look at records and let's see what happened in the past how it is linked to climate change uh how climate change is linked to poor urban planning what were how does history provide a precedent those kinds of issues i think i would like to end there i would like to particularly thank pak sarkavi pak purnavat juru sansejara bumurtiati all of you for making my trip to airlanga virtual trip to airlanga so memorable i'm also very grateful to the questions that were raised by pak laode bu from the medical jibu juliasi from the medical faculty very very helpful questions i think it forces me to rethink my research from an anthropological and a medical perspective respectively thank you so much thank you so much i would like love to collaborate with you in the future Thank you Mipek. Nah, mungkin kita bisa memberikan tepuk tangan kepada Pak Mipek yang hari ini pagi ini sangat luar biasa memberikan ilmunya ya kepada kita semua. Uh, kami sangat berterima kasih Pak Vivek Nilakanta atas kehadirannya pagi ini. Uh, mungkin uh, bisa lain waktu, next year we can uh, collaborate our uh, next program. Gitu. Baik, uh, tidak berpanjang kata, saya akhiri uh, webinar hari ini. Semoga apa yang kita dapatkan pagi ini bermanfaat untuk kita semuanya. Uh, salam sehat semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Matur nuwun terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih Bu Yulia. Terima kasih Hipe. Please to meet you. Terima kasih Hipe. Terima kasih.